Hello, my name is Patrick Longa. Today, I will talk about our project title, The Cost to Break Psych, a comparative hardware based analysis with AES and SHA 3. This is joint work with Wang Wang and Jacob Seffer. Before jumping to the main part of the presentation, let me give you a brief summary about the project. Let's start with the problem that we are tackling. PSYC, that stands for Super Singular Arsenic Key Encapsulation, is an alternate candidate in the third round of the NIST post-quantum cryptography standardization process. And it's in fact the only isoine-based scheme in the competition. This is important, given that we think that diversity should play an important role in the selection process, in which case, PSYC becomes a very attractive alternative if we notice that most finalists in the competition are lattice-based schemes. Maybe the single most critical drawback of Psyche is that it's relatively slow. However, on the other hand, Psyche has demonstrated to have a solid security. The problem is that currently Psyche is being penalized because its parameters are chosen very conservatively using a random access memory model. We observe that this hurts Psyche's performance more than it should. So what we do in this work is to analyze the security of Psyche, AES, and SHA-3 using a more realistic budget based cost model. We use AES and SHA-3 here because these are used as reference points to determine the NIST security levels. In our model, we can consider both computing and memory costs together with historical price data and the use of a conservative projection of future costs. For our analysis, we also propose an efficient architecture for the single most critical computation in the cryptanalysis of Psyche, that is the large degree isogeny computation. This architecture is then used to model an ASIC power instance of the Van Orschot Wiener or VAO parallel collision finding algorithm. This algorithm is the most efficient algorithm currently known to break Psyche. Now, let me briefly comment on our results. As conjecture, we conclude that the current site parameters are very conservative and over offer a wide margin of quantum and classical security. Our model allows us to quantify such security gap. Accordingly, we propose new parameters that fit more closely the NIST security targets. These new parameters are still chosen conservatively. We also report new implementations of Psyche using these new parameters and show significant gains in performance and bandwidth. This is a win-win situation. As I said before, the execution time is the most critical drawback of Psyche. On the other hand, bandwidth is one of the most attractive advantages of Psyche. So reducing key sizes makes Psyche even more attractive. Okay, so now let's go deeper into the details of the project. Let me give you some basics about post-quantum key exchange from supersingular isogenes. Psych is in fact based on SIDH, which stands for Supersingular Isogeny Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange. This protocol was proposed back in 2011 by David Zhao and Luca Defeo. As we mentioned before, SIDH has a solid security history in its spite of its young age. The best known attack is the classical VAO algorithm. So, on a classical and quantum computer, the attack complexity is exponential. Now, Psyche is the NCCA secure version of SIDH. It was designed in 2017 and then submitted to the NIST post-quantum cryptography standardization process. Let's recall some facts about elliptic curves and isogenies that are important to understand how SIDH and Psyche work. Let's assume we have two elliptic curves, E1 and E2, which are defined over an extension field L of characteristic, characteristic P, where P is prime. An isogeny is then defined as a non-constant rational map that maps E1 to E2 and that also preserves the identity element. Now let's mention some relevant properties that are important here. For example, isogenies are group homomorphisms. Another important one is that isomorphism classes are essentially subsets of elliptic curves that share the same J invariant. Finally, given a prime P, we have approximately P over 12 
isomorphism classes of super, super singular elliptic curves all defined over fp square. One way to understand SIDH is with this idea of super singular isogeny graphs. In this graph, we assume that the vertices or dots represent the isomorphism classes of super singular curves, meaning that they contain a subset of curves, all with the same in J invariant. Now, the edges that connect these vertices are the isogenies, which have a fixed prime degree. So we can have graphs with different degrees. For example, on the left, we have the degree two isogeny graph, and on the right, we have the degree three isogeny graph. So as you can see, the graphs map the isomorphism classes in different ways. And this is the idea behind the SIDH protocol. Now, let me explain how SIDH and SIG work in a nutshell. Let's start with SIDH. Let's assume Alice is represented in red and Bob in blue. Again, we have our vertices, which are the isomorphism classes, just visually expanded on this slide. So we start by fixing an initial elliptic curve that we call here E0. This one belongs to a certain isomorphism class. Then Alice proceeds by generating a secret isogeny that we call phi A. And with that secret, she maps E0 to another elliptic curve that we call E sub A belonging to another isomorphism class. Bob does similarly, using a secret isogeny 5b that maps E0 to another elliptic curve that we call E sub b. Now, E sub a and E sub b are the public key information. They are exchanged between the parties. So then we proceed as follows. Alice takes Bob, Bob's public key E sub b, and using another secret isogeny 5 prime a, she maps E sub b to another curve E sub a b. Bob does similarly to map E sub A to another curve that we call E sub B A. If everything is done properly, then E sub A B and E sub B A are expected to belong to the same isomorphism class, meaning that they should have the same J invariant, which then can be used as a share key. All right, but the problem with SIDH is that it is not secure when keys are reused. It is only recommended in ephemeral mode. That's why we need Psyche. Psyche uses a variant of the Hofheim Hobelman skills transform to convert an NCPA secure public key encryption scheme into an NCCA secure key encapsulation mechanism. In this slide, you can see the details of the Psyche protocol. I won't go into too much detail here, just wanted to highlight the three stages that make up Psyche. As a CAM, it has a key generation stage where we generate a secret key and public key pair. The public key is then sent to the encapsulator, which proceeds to do an encryption of a randomly generated message M. So it produces a ciphertext C and also a share key. The ciphertext is sent back to the decapsulator, which proceeds to do a decryption using the secret key. And then there is a re-encryption to make sure that the ciphertext was well formed. If that's the case, then the share key is output. Now, the security of SIDH and PSYCH is based on the so-called computational supersingular isogeny problem. It is defined as follows. Let's assume we have two supersingular curves, E1 and E2, defined over FP square. In our setting, these curves are connected, are connected by an isogeny with a large and smooth degree. Then the problem is as follows. Given points P and Q that lie on E1 and the images of these points using the isogeny on E2, then the hard problem is to compute the isogeny, phi. Now, let's talk about how the security strength of a given crypto system is determined, and then focus on the specific case of parameter selection of, for psych. Okay, so for a given crypto system, one can use a simplistic but very conservative approach that is based on the query complexity of the cryptanalysis of the scheme. In the case of AES-128A, for example, a brute force attack requires two to the 128 AES execution calls. And this determines the security of this scheme in this case. 
One can do a slightly more sophisticated estimation using the random access memory model. So for example, one can use the complexity of the iteration of the tag in terms of gates, instructions, or cycles. In our example with AES128, NIST determined that the implementation of this scheme takes approximately two to the 15 gates. That means that, that, that the security of AES128 is estimated as two to the 128 times two to the 15, which give us a total of two to the 143 classical gates. And this is precisely what is used to determine security level one in the NIST process. What are the disadvantages of this approach? Well, the communication and memory costs are totally ignored. And that crucially penalizes crypto systems for which cryptanalysis actually requires significant, um, significant amounts of memory. And this is precisely the case of Psyc. All right. In the specific case of Psyc and its parameter selection, first of all, we need to determine the search space. This is essentially given by the number of half-order elliptic, elliptic curve subgroups, and this is approximately p to the one-fourth. And this is the parameter that was used by, this, by the Psyc team to determine round one parameters. In this case, the supersingular subunit problem can be modeled as a black box close finding problem that can be solved classically with meet in the middle in time and space complexity p to the one fourth. So, for example, to match the 128 bit security of AES 128 at level one, we needed a prime of approximately 512 bits. Later on, Adge and others pointed out that the amount of memory required by the meet in the middle attack was unrealistic they suggested to use the VAW algorithm instead. You can see the corresponding time complexity in the slide. They also suggested to use the storage to certain amount, specifically to two to the 80 memory units. For example, under the light of this new analysis, the bit length of the prime required for security level one could be reduced to 448 bits. So round two parameters were updated accordingly. For example, you can see here that psych P503 that uses a prime of 503 bits was replaced by site P434 that uses a prime of 434 bits. And this is uh, for NIST level one. This reduction in sizes translated to, in, to an important speed up and reduction of public key and ciphertext sizes. In this table, we can see a summary of security estimates. For site, the number correspond to round two and also round three because the parameters remain unchanged. In the column level NIST classical gate requirements, we display the estimates that determine the different security levels, using AES for levels one, three, and five, and SHA-3 for level two. The two last columns on the right correspond to PSYC, with numbers estimated by Adj and others in the first case, and by Costello and others in the second case. In both cases, the memory requirement is fixed to two to the 80 memory units, as explained before. As can be seen, the estimates marked in red are slightly below the gate requirements from NEST, and this is a first issue that we observe here. This is justified as follows in the psych specification document, and I quote, although their times fall slightly below NEST required gate counts, the corresponding conversion to gate counts would see these parameters comfortably exceed NIST requirement. End of quote. So in some cases, there is a gap between the NIST levels and the estimates of the official site parameters, and this remains somewhat unexplained. The second issue is that there is no fundamental reason to use the memory requirement two to the eight. So in this work, we solve these two issues as we will explain later on. Let's now proceed to explain our budget-based cost model that we use to estimate the cost of cryptanalyzing psych and to estimate its security. So this model consists of some easy to understand steps. First of all, we fix the budget of the attacker. Then we distribute the budget to get computing and storage resources such that the time to run the cryptanalysis is minimized. And finally, the security of the scheme is estimated as the time it takes to break it. Similar approaches have already been used in the literature. For example, Van Orschot and Wiener did it in 94 and 99. 
However, there are some drawbacks in most previous studies. The main one is that the analysis is typically focused on a specific point in time. We improved the cost model in two crucial aspects that we believe increased the significantly the confidence in the analysis. First, we analyzed historical price information of semiconductors and memory components in order to determine the soundness of using this information to evaluate the cost of cryptanalysis. And second, we apply simple but conservative projections to estimate the costs in the future, which is ultimately the information that is relevant for a crypto system. The piece of, of information that we need for the analysis is the cost of components, including gates and memories. What we did was to compile public release prices of microprocessor units or MPUs from Intel and AMD for the years between 2000 and 2020. We use public transist transistor counts, and also we use the standard assumption that a gate consists of four transistors. In addition, we applied some scaling to these release prices to approximate them to actual production costs, given that release prices include additional costs, eh, including some margin for profit. To do this approxim approximation, we follow the procedure by Ken and Man. We did a similar estimate for memory components, such as hard disk drives, DRAMs, and SSD memories. And finally, we also validated our results with the forecasts provided by the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors, or ITRS, which was an international consortium that coordinated the progress and development of semiconductors in the 2000s. Here, you can see a graph with the cost estimates for the different components. We display the number of gates that can be bought per dollar, that is displayed as, as a blue line, and the num number of bytes that can be bought per dollar uh, display uh, as the red lines, uh, in this case, considering uh, different types of memories. As can be seen, the costs of the different components have increased in a very uniform way. This is visible by looking at the solid green line at the bottom that represents the ratios, the ratio between the costs of gates and the costs of memory. This result provides evidence of the relatively stable relationship between the two, uh, between the two costs, which is one of the key aspects that give us confidence confidence in using the cost information to determine the cost of cryptanalysis and therefore the security of our scheme. All right, so we obtain robust cost information for the analysis that we were carrying out. What we needed next was to collect area and time data for the different crypto systems and their analysis. So let's start with Psyche. For Psyche, what we did was to design an efficient large degree isogeny accelerator, which is the main component in cryptanalyzing the scheme. The goal in this case was to achieve an optimal area time product on an ASIC. So we implemented all the main computations, including point addition, point doubling, isogeny evaluation, and isogeny computation uh, for the case of the degree four uh, operations, which, is, uh, which are actually the most efficient ones for Psyche. Here in the screen, we show a diagram of our architecture. Under the hood of these operations, we also need an efficient uh, field arithmetic architecture. And that's what we did. We also proposed a novel unified multiply, multiplier over FP squared that enables a theoretically optimal parallelization of the internal operations. All right, so we implemented this efficient hardware accelerator and then we proceeded to obtain all the data that was required to plug into our cost model. So first of all, we collected cycle counts for the different operations. You can see the table with the re best results that we obtained for each parameter set. At the top, you can see the case of the round two and three parameters, but at the bottom, there are new alternative parameters that I'm going to discuss later on. Note that we applied a very conservative approach. We ignored all the control, computation, and data communication overheads. This gives us a safety margin in our analysis. 
Then we proceeded to obtain area and time results using synthesis tools, tools for ASICs. The results were obtained with an open source NAND gate 45 nanometer library. The results corresponding to the large degree isoinia accelerator are displayed in the table on the right. As before, we applied a conservative approach, basically all the control circuitry that is required to implement the rest of the VAO algorithm is also ignored, like for example, the hash function. We then proceeded to do the same analysis for AES. In the case of AES, uh, we did the analysis with a parallel attack based on rainbow chains. The complexity of the attack is shown in the screen. Uh, in this case, it corresponds to using M parallel engines, targeting a key K of bit length B. To obtain the area time information, we used, to our knowledge, the most efficient AES implementation available in the literature for ASICs. And in this case, efficiency is uh, defined as, as, as the best area time product. We follow a similar approach for SHA-3, in this case, using the VAO algorithm for collision find. Okay. So at this point, we had area and time information and uh, for psych, AES and SHA-3. And what we needed to do was to plug in all this data into our model. For this purpose, we wrote a Python script that made all the calculations for different years using different budgets from one million up to one trillion dollars. Uh, and as, as I mentioned before, we also included simple cost projections up to the year 2040. Let me illustrate uh, our results with the case of the hundred billion dollars. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, well, I have to mention that other budgets also achieve similar results. The results for the years uh, between 2000 and 2020 were obtained with historical price information, while the results for the years between two, 2025 and 2040 uh, used our projections. On the y-axis, you can see the logarithm of the number of years of the number of years that it takes to break a certain crypto system. The estimates for AES are in red, corresponding to level one with AES 128, level three with AES 192, and level five with AES 256. The estimates for psych are in blue, corresponding to psych P434, P610, and P751, uh, respectively for the same security levels. And as can be seen, there is a very wide gap between the security estimates for AES and PSYCH, which confirm that the current round three PSYCH parameters do fulfill the NIST targets and in fact offer much higher security than expected. So what we did was to try to choose parameters that follow more closely the NIST targets. And these are the ones that I'm showing the screen now are labeled with the word new, PSYCH P377, P546 and um, site P697 for levels 1, 3, and 5, respectively. Let's remember that this still includes some conservative safety margins, which we think makes our parameters safe to be used to target the NIST levels. Right. So, to finish this presentation, I will share some uh, software implementation results that we got that showcase the potential benefit of using the proposed parameters. The results in this table in the screen correspond to an X64 machine with an X uh, with an X Skylake CPU. The side round three parameters are displayed on the left and the alternative parameters on the right. In each case, there is a very nice reduction in bandwidth, that is in the public key sizes, which is displayed in terms of bytes. Given that one of the most attractive features of Psyche is that it provides the smallest key sizes of any of the post-quantum candidates in the NIST competition, this reduction makes Psyche even more attractive. Also in the table, we display the computing time in terms of millions of cycles. You can see the significant speed up when moving from the round two, three parameters to the new uh, alternative parameters. So for example, Psych P377, intended for level one, can be executed in close to four milliseconds 
This is in a 3.4 gigahertz machine, and which is uh, about 1.4 times faster than site P434, which is the current round three uh, parameter for level one. So again, this provides a very important speed up in the computation, which uh, arguably pushes Psyche in the right direction to make it more amenable for many more applications. To finish, let me point out a couple of links with additional information. We have our full paper version on ePrint containing many more results and analysis. Also, you can visit our GitHub repository that contains our hardware implementations including a software hardware co-design prototype of the uh, full VOW VAU algorithm. And, and this GitHub repository also contains our software implementations, implementations of the new parameters. Thank you.